to Thai Institute. We'll give everyone a few more minutes to join in and then we'll go ahead and uh, get started as well. Hello folks, uh, my name is Naeem Zafar. I will be the workshop leader today. And just customarily, we'll uh, give a few minutes, no more than five, maybe less. And the critical point is if 30% of the people who registered show up, then we start. So that can happen very quickly. We are at, yeah, we are at 23%. Uh, so 30% or five minutes, whichever happens early, we can start. In the meantime, in the chat window or Q&A, you could ask questions and uh, maybe you know, even tell me what would you like to be learning. And uh, so we can give you some additional information and cover the topic, you know, type in the chat window or Q&A, what, brought you here today, what would you like to learn? Um, so yeah, you guys can either in, uh, put this in the chat and if you guys have any questions throughout the uh, webinar, go ahead and just put them in the Q&A uh, feature there as well. We'll go ahead and take care of that and uh, send them over to me. Nihar, while we're waiting for uh, some people to gather in critical mass, do you want to do a little commercial for Thai Institute? Sure. So Thai Institute um, kind of is one of the pillars of Thai. So Thai um, is focused on networking, funding, mentoring, and education as well. So Thai Institute falls under the education uh, function where we try to provide information that can be of assistance to startups or to entrepreneurs. Um, and we have uh, names Zafar, we have Paul Singh, we have quite a few people who um, you know, have given their time as well. Uh, so we wanna thank them um, and I see some questions uh, starting to join in. I see some people in, uh, in uh, presenting into the uh, chat as well. So Neem, are you able to see uh, people when they make any comments in the uh, chat? It should be under all panelists. So they have yeah. to bring some uh, uh, points that they want to talk to. Um, yeah, I have opened uh, the Q&A panel as well as chat panel and there's a, one question on both. So we'll awesome. be able to address those. Okay. And so, like I said, so, go ahead. Now. So it's uh, six oh five. So um, we can go ahead and uh, get started. And if anyone else comes in, this uh, meeting will be recorded and posted on YouTube uh, for anyone to go back and um, re-listen to any of the lecture as well. Well, very good. Uh, so again, welcome. This is uh, Naeem Zafar. I have been uh, running the Thai Institute for a couple of years and uh, have done many workshops. We're planning to do many more workshops on any topic has to do with entrepreneurship or career, shaping your career. So it's good to see some comments and questions coming in. And I think uh, some of the questions we heard already that we want to hear about ideal pitch deck, sequence of topics, maximum minimum number of pages. I plan to address that. And some other questions which have come in about uh, product market fit, what investors care about, key items for customer validation. Yeah, that is exactly the topic. So let me uh, get started with all that stuff. And I am going to make sure that we uh, can also be recording this. Enable. So, Let's give you a bit of a sense of uh, myself because not everybody knows me, some people do. Uh, we are gonna cover this five topics that how do you get the investor ready? What does investor ready means? Because you don't wanna approach an investor too soon. 
because you only get one chance to make a first impression. And if you screw that up, in their mind, they write you off as if somebody who's not ready, is clueless, doesn't get it, then it'll be very hard for you to knock on the same door. So you want to be ready. So tactically, you need five things in your hand before you approach them. You need some initial email. What does it look like? What does it say? I get many of these emails that most of them are wrong, boring, and make a bad impression. So I'll tell you what it should look like. What is an executive summary? What's an investor deck, investor presentation? And what's the financial model? And why do you need one? And how do you make one? And some kind of icebreaker. So these are the tactical things you should be in your possession before you approach an investor. So let me give you a little background on myself. I'm an electrical engineer. I went to Brown University and then uh, studied engineering and was a chip designer, worked for Honeywell uh, for some time. This is when I started my company uh, in Minnesota five years later. That didn't work so well. Uh, Prabhu Goyal ended up buying it uh, back in early days. Then I came to California and joined a company named QuickTurn and we invented the hardware emulation technology. I was there for 11 years, started as a senior design engineer and five, six years into it, I was VP of marketing. So we went public and today every company with complex chip design uses our technology. It was bought by Cadence. Then I was at a couple of other companies, Silicon Design System, Pixels and EDS space before working at a fingerprint sensor company. So we invented the fingerprint sensor you find in Apple iPhones. And then we did another company, Britzer Mobile and Mobile Security that was acquired by Oracle. I've been teaching entrepreneurship at Cal, University of California, Berkeley for 15 years, as well as Northeastern at Brown. Currently for the last five years, I've been running a company in ad tech space, which is uh, called Telesense. So artificial intelligence and IoT for ad tech. So that's uh, what I wanna share with you. I have a few books on this topic. So if you wanna get deeper into any one of these topics, these books may be useful for you to get. They're also available on Amazon or at namesofart.com. All right, so let's talk about raising money. First you realize raising money from venture capitalists is a big deal and it's not easy. A typical partner at a VC firm is approached maybe a thousand times a year with business plans. They don't even look at most of them. They look at them if it came from somebody they trust, another VC, another investor, a CEO or a founder of a company they invested in. They may look at a hundred companies face-to-face, -face, take an initial meeting. And from that, there may be 20 of them, they'll go further, take a second or third meeting, do diligence, and may fund one or two companies per year per partner. So you realize odds of getting funding is very small. So my point is you have to be super investor ready and do not want to approach them prematurely. So let's talk about strategically. What does an investor need to see in you before they can get excited and truly get excited? And the answer is, if you have these five elements in your possession, you become very attractive. So five elements being, you have an idea, not an idea, but you have validated it by talking to actual users and customers. How many? Six, 11, the correct number is between 50 and 100. You have to have enough conversation to really listen to people, to understand what is the real problem. Solution is the easy part. Understanding the problem is the hard part. Most entrepreneurs get prematurely excited when they jump on a solution or already have a solution looking for a problem. So if you can come to demonstrate that because of your unique background, your unusual work history, or the research or work you have done, you have discovered an unmet need and you have validated it, that passes item number one. Then item number two is that you have put together a small initial team of co-founders. If you're approaching them solo, that's a red flag. This means either your idea is not compelling enough that nobody wants to join you, or you're such a control freak that nobody wants to join you. Both are red flags. Any company which is going to be significant 
hence attractive to VCs, is never done by a single founder. You need, job is just too big. You need a couple of three people to attack it from different angles. Then next thing they wanna see is that, do you have some financial model? Do you have some clue? What will you do with this money? How, what milestones you plan to hit? Who do you need to hire? So Excel financial model is answers all those questions. Do you know how to put one together? Most people don't. Good news, I'm gonna give you a preview tonight. We can do a separate workshop just on that. And finally, you need pitch, which tells the whole story. And we're gonna go through that today. And number five, some proof point that whatever you come up with, people care about it. Somebody wants to buy it, it solves a problem. So this is what you need to be able to convince them uh, that something really does work. So, somebody said, will you be sharing the slide deck? I can, but Shyam, this should not be your reason for not taking notes. You listen better when you take notes because you have to synthesize what you're hearing into your own words. So I always advise, take notes. I always do. So, all right. So where are we? We're talking about this uh, five things. Okay. So, you know, feel free to even uh, raise hand, interrupt, or at least write up then, uh, something in the chat. We can an answer your question as we go along. How do you approach investors? The seven step process. First step is just like you wanna meet somebody, you wanna research them. You wanna know what do they like? What do they invest in? What companies have they invested in? Where they went to school? Because every investor have their own theory, what is hot, what is not. On 11th floor, they love 5G and telecommunication infrastructure. At fourth floor, they hate telecommunication infrastructure. It's all about consumer, uh, social, local, whatever. So you have to see, do they resonate with me? And then you wanna seek an introduction. Somebody they know and trust because you don't want to be the 900 who gets bypassed, but you wanna be that smaller bucket which actually gets looked at. The next thing is you don't send them your whole business plan. You wanna send them initially just an email to see is this the area they are interested in? Are they looking to invest? Because sometimes they have already invested in similar companies. They were not gonna invest two, invest in two similar companies. So you wanna ask that question. Don't send them anything. If they show some interest in some area, then you send them an executive summary. And what's the purpose of sending the executive summary? It is to intrigue them enough to get a face-to-face -face meeting. Because this face-to-face -face meeting is when you can now wow them with your dynamic personality, your unique insights, your commitment, your motivation. This is what you're seeking for. The whole point of that is to pitch them and intrigue them to wanna to learn more. And finally, they, if they like you enough, then they wanna meet with you multiple times. Topic number six, to build momentum build comfort and if all that passes and you still look like something is interesting and you're making progress then they want to have a compelling event to bring them to a close so this is the seven step process how you approach investors and how to romance them so the five items i'm going to talk about five items are all listed here with the cue balls so you need an icebreaker that's the, how to get introduction an executive summary that's item number two. So these five items you have to be ready are listed here with the cue balls. So, all right. What's a compelling event? Somebody says, well, compelling event is, you know, sometimes, again, I dating analogy works every time. Sometimes you have to have a compelling event to make sure that he actually proposes. Because if he's getting all the benefits without the obligation, why not keep dating? Same thing happens in this case. Investors watching your progress, are you making progress? This, usually they're not in a hurry to invest because you're in a hurry, they're not in a hurry. They wanna keep watching you. Are you stumbling? Are you making progress? So you almost have to force the function. So look, you like us, we have some other people interested. So we're gonna be doing a closing by end of May. So I'm just giving you a heads up in case you wanted to propose a term sheet 
then please let us know by the first week in May. So that's a compelling event by forcing other parties to come in so you can force their hand to make an offer, offer to invest. All right, so how long does all this takes? Well, it doesn't take a few weeks, it takes a few months. The reason is the first two or three or five or six months, you have to do all this conversation and interviews so you can prepare the five items I just talked about. So once you've done your homework, you've talked to enough customers, you have financial model, you have clarity, then you start approaching the suitable investors which you have researched. And even if you can find few, if they like it, then they want you to meet, go meet with this guy we trust, go meet with my partner. Every time you wanna approach somebody, usually the meeting is two weeks out. So they don't like hurry up, show up tomorrow kind of a meeting. So then you pitch to them and they like you, then you pitch to somebody else. It's not uncommon for, I've raised money from VCs maybe you know, 10 times. It takes about good, anywhere from 20 to 50 pitches to various VCs before one or two or three show interest. So this whole process takes many months to pitch to enough VCs. Then if they like you enough, then they do due diligence. And somebody asked a question and Naren asked a question uh, about when I say talk to 50 to 100 customers validation, what does that mean? So let, let's talk about this for you and it's an important question. See, when you think world needs some, there's a problem. Those are just your, you have some assumptions in your mind. You believe, okay, I think we can, uh, people will pay $20 a month for this. We think only the older people will be interested in this. We think uh, we probably can, should be selling this mostly in uh, California and New York. We should mostly be selling this product to doctors and dentists, whatever, I'm making this up. These are all assumptions. You don't know if they're true. So what you need to be doing is interview people who supposedly have that pain and ask them several clarifying questions without ever revealing your idea. Your, or that interviews, those conversations is about to understanding customers' pain points. If this is a big problem, Mr. Customer, why, where have you looked for a solution? Why haven't you selected a solution? Was it the price? Was it something else? Where did you look? Who makes the decision? Who can kill the decision? At what price point will be a no-brainer? Why haven't you solved it? All, more you know about how they think, what the problem is, then you come back and say, can we design a solution which fits that? This is what I mean by the, those 50 to 100 conversation to really clarify and validate what are you building for the right audience? Who needs it more? So this is the market research part. We have a separate workshop on how to do market research. We can go into that separately. Today, I'm gonna to focus on your, what you need to be investor ready. All right, so if you can pass through the diligence part, then if you're lucky, you'll get a term sheet. And term sheet is what? It's a non-binding offer to invest, a four to eight page word document with a bunch of legalese. And this is when you get excited. Now you have a few days to negotiate the term sheet and come to some agreement and handshake. If you can come to a handshake and agreement, you agree with the terms, now starts the legal diligence. Now we wanna start spending the money in a lawyer to make sure all the things you said about your IP, your incorporation paperwork, founders agreement are all correct and reasonable. So it just takes another month. So the whole process takes several months, not quick. So you have to make sure you have enough gas in the tank before you start raising money. I suggest allocating yourself about six months is sort of quite reasonable, usually takes longer. Okay, so where are we? So again, what do you need to have? In elevator pitch, you also wanna have a couple of different version, a 10 second version and 30 second version. You wanna have one or maybe two page maximum, but really one page executive summary because we're just trying to intrigue them to get the face to face. Uh, then of course you have a pitch deck. Over there, I recommend three versions. A one slide version, because if some investor wants to meet with you at, at lunchtime, 
you may not have the opportunity to take out your laptop, flip it over and try to give the presentation. It's awkward, nobody likes it. What you wanna be able to do is bring out from your pocket a single piece of paper and be able to give the whole story from a single piece of paper. That's your one slide version. Very useful, I've many times used it. Then you also wanna have a three to four slide version because somebody wants to say, send me some slides before you, you know, before I'm willing to give you a meeting. And this is your way of able to extend not the whole deck, but three or four slide version. So they kind of know, are we doing the relevant thing? Should they even come? And then you have a full 15 slide version, approximately 15 slide, more in the backup slides, which is in when you get the face-to-face -face meeting, you can present. So we'll talk about in more detail what goes into that. So, yeah. So again, so far, so good. In, in case somebody wants to have other comments, question, you know, send me through a chat or Q&A so I can address them, but I wanna make sure that you guys are with me. I'm not losing you. So next thing is, how do you approach investors? So you have done the homework, you have met the user, you have clarity on the unmet need, you have done the research, and you're ready to talk to them. Now remember, when you ever meet them face to face, you also need to be careful not to make certain mistakes. Some people are unnecessarily secretive. Somebody asked the question, well, uh, what are you working on? And they'll give you some vague answer, trying to hide the details and the truth. Trust me, whatever idea you have, it's not that unique that the moment you say it, somebody will just copy it. If it's that simple, then it's not a good idea in the first place. The difficulties in execution. Execution takes a lot of illogical, irrational amount of commitment and sacrifice. So just because you utter the idea, no, assuming other person is equally motivated and do all those things, highly unlikely. So don't worry about that. Of course, don't be vague. Don't be boring, no long speeches, answer the question. Because I see this all the time, investor will ask the question, so what was your revenue in uh, 2019? And your answer will be, well, uh, we just finished the product development in June, and then we mostly focused on partnerships, and we're planning to hire three salespeople next year, and we think uh, we'll be selling in multiple uh, geographies. What did you just do? You blew your credibility. Your answer was zero. Would you like me to explain a little more, more about why, why it was zero? If they say yes, then you go into some detail, but answer the question. And this is what mistakes I see that all the time people making. So, so somebody Aubrey said, could samples and templates of elevator page slides, one, two, three, and business summary be emailed to me in this email address? Okay, what am I? Just I'm teaching you. Learn it. So I just give you an example of one three's fifteen slide. I'm going to show you the fifteen slide version in a second. But the point is, no, it's not that simple. You got to do some hard work yourself. If everything is emailed to you, you need to extract what I'm teaching you and for be able to create your own one three and five slide version. But I can I can give you examples of my own company, and yes, I can uh, do that if you ask me specifically. All right, approach. So how do you approach? And is the, if you wanna approach the people, you wanna get an introduction. So I've seen, for example, people use LinkedIn very effectively saying, John, I know we are both connected to Larry. I am I just quit Google two months ago and I've been trying to work on this problem. We already have a team of three and the first three customers. Would you be interested in meeting and hearing more? Something like that. So this kind of a message can be used in LinkedIn. You may have to upgrade to in-mail for a month or two, but that's not too expensive. You also meet them at uh, different events. UC Berkeley, Stanford University, you have all kinds of events going on all the time. So I suggest you mingle there because there'll be investors speaking. If you put your email at startupdigest.com, they'll tell you all the events happening, not all the events, many events happening around Silicon Valley. So you'll be able to go to them. Some are free, some are not free. Thai does many of these events themselves. So that will be a good place for you to start. 
So, you know, if you want to write an email to somebody, it doesn't need to be complicated. Something as simple as this will be just perfectly fine. It fits in a single iPhone screen. No lambika honey. You say, Tom, you mentioned somebody, Joe Wire or Wilmer Hale mentioned that you, you may be interested in startup. So this is, you already know they're connected, they know each other. So using his name in the first sentence, they know it has some credibility. You know, some random guy tried to sell him something. So you use Joe, Joe's name in the first sentence. Then you talk about your value proposition. We're reducing the waste and spoilage of food using wireless sensors and AI software. Market size is big. We already have some. Then So credibility through introduction, value proposition, traction, that's it, those three topics. And then you say, I would like to see if this area of interest, uh, may I stop by to walk you through our pitch deck? And you put all your contact information, in, including the phone number, in your signature. So many times I get email from people, no details in the bottom, no de I have no idea except the guy's name. And sometimes the guys have some funky email title like ship3003 at gmail.com. That doesn't tell me anything. Because first thing this person is gonna do is click on your LinkedIn and see, are you real? And, and then be able to you know, see what, what you've been tweeting about and then may call you or email you. So you wanna make it easy on them, as few clicks as possible, put everything down there. So, uh, let's see. So, let's talk about the executive summary. What exactly goes into that? Are we ready for executive summary? Any questions so far? Things we have covered? Am I losing audience? Not yet. All right. So, let me know, guys. I, I, I'm going to keep moving for fast. Okay, what's the executive summary? What exactly goes into it? So, well, before the executive summary, let's talk about the icebreaker. See, when you want to approach somebody, you want to have some way to start icebreaker to start a conversation, especially, uh, especially in uh, in a face-to-face -face event. If you go to see them, you meet them at some uh, Thai event or some other event. So you want to, it's so easy these days to find out what somebody has been tweeting about. So you want to be able to go to the media post, go to the LinkedIn profile, just write down two or three facts. So like the guy went to school to Notre Dame. He played ice hockey. Uh, he worked at, uh, I don't know, Phillips Semiconductor 10 years ago. These are all icebreakers. Because you know this allows you to start a conversation about something which you may have in common or something you know about. That shows them that you took some time to learn about them, didn't just show up clueless. So this is again very easy to do, it takes less than five minutes, and you may be able to have a leg up on other people they met that week. Okay, executive summary, these are the 12 topics, which is basically your business plan. And these are the same 12 topics is an investor presentation. So it's common sense. What problem are, are you solving the unmet need and who has this problem? This is a paragraph, it's not a lambi kahani. It's not like a page, it's like three sentences. You want to then give what's, the, what's wrong with the current alternatives they have? What is your solution? What's your magic sauce? Why your solution is brilliant? How do you compare versus other alternative users have? Comparative landscape. Number six, what tar market segment are you targeting and how big it is in dollars? The unit of market size is dollars, total available market. That's your first six items. So if you wanna do a short executive summary, just these first six items is all you need. But sometimes they wanna see longer, then you can have just those items. The first six are very essential. That's just enough to get me. Then the number seven is what, how will you make money? The fancy word, your, what's your business model? What's your go-to market strategy? How will you promote this product? How will you create the awareness? Who is in the team? Not just the founders, but advisors. What progress have you made so far? What are the, some of the upcoming milestones over the next 12 to 18 months? What is your financial projection? How big is this company can get? They need to show that you have thought through the business side of it. It's not just an engineer. You are a business person. They're investing in a business. And finally, you're asked, what are you asking? 
a million dollars, five million dollars, ten million dollars. It will take you from what stage to what stage of de-risking the company. So these are the 12 topics which will be in your investor presentation. These are the 12 topics or a subset of them you want to cover in executive summary. So it's not complicated. The mistake people make is, by the way, when they present, they spend like 75% or 80% of the time in item number one through five. Maybe one through six, one through five mostly. What they really want to hear, investors, is item seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And you run out of time. So you have to really be smart about this. The harder part is for you to condense your whole business plan. You've been working for six months, one year, into a 20 minute presentation or a two page executive summary. That is hard. And you'll, you'll fight with yourself. You won't know what to delete. It's so good, it's so accurate. But that's exactly what you need to do. So let's tell you some more stuff. So, you know, some of the people ask the question, uh, how do I follow up if there's no reply to an email? Well, again, when in doubt, go back to dating analogy. Suppose you send her an email and she doesn't reply. What do you do? Give up? Well, depending on how you feel about her, you may ask some friend, do they know her? Say, hey, what's going on with her? You may write again using different style. You may try to research and pop out of the gym to surprise her. You may suggest a coffee instead of dinner. All those techniques apply with the investors. You wanna change your approach, but after some time, two or three times, if she doesn't reply, you probably smart to give up. Same thing with investors. So whenever in doubt, like, what do I do now? Think about this. if it was a dating scene, what would you do? I found 99.9 .9 times is the same answer. I may even write a book about this because it really is true. Uh, so how is services business different than product business? Well, they're different in some ways, but the 12 item I'm outlining here apply to both services or product business. The difference is the business model is different. The profitability and scalability is not as attractive. That's why it doesn't attract as many investors as product business does, but all these 12 items are identical. So, 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 so the question is, what is the ask? Should it be conservative or aggressive? Look, whatever you think is conservative is super aggressive. I've never seen an entrepreneur projections come true. And investors know that. They're gonna do their own subtraction from whatever you present, but you should really have one, one plan, a reasonable plan. You need to be fairly conservative in the early years so you can meet them because they're watching you. You could be a little bit more aggressive and optimistic in year four and five, but how much you need to raise will come out of your financial model, which we can look, look at in about half an hour or maybe 20 minutes. So you wanna be able to, able to compute how much dollars do you need to go from this stage of the company to next inflection point? This is how you're gonna know how much to ask for. It's not an, just uh, give me a million dollars. Why? Oh, it's good for a year. That's a terrible answer. When, what if after one year you still have no customers, no prototype, no nothing going on, then you're even riskier than today. You wanna jump safely to the next inflection point and how long would it take? You compute a number how much to ask for. So let's look at some more stuff. So if you want to see what does the executive summary look like, it's not complicated. Look what did I just do? I just went to Google and wrote down example of good executive summary. All kinds of interesting things pop up. It's not complicated. How to be write a good executive summary? And there are articles about this, and there's a how to write executive summary in B plan and whatnot. But a good resource is right up here. Sequoia Capital, one of the premier venture capital firm, have seen so many bad pitches. They tell you on their website, bring us something which looks like this. So this is great. And, and recent Horowitz also does something like that. So 
you, you can go to some of these big VCs that teach you, that tell you what they need to see. So let's take a look here. So executive summary, this is garage.com, which is a VC firm. They writing a compelling executive summary right there. Sequoia, writing a business plan, all kinds of articles up there. Sequoia Capital pitch deck template. So they're here. You don't have to guess, Aubrey, go to these links which I'm projecting and just find out. It's all here. Let me give you a couple of examples because this is the companies I know. So Organi is two female doctors at Stanford were starting this company. So look at that. This is one pager. So I'm just showing one page. It's a half a page, sits on a slide. The second slide is the other half of the page. Not long. What does it say? It says executive summary right up front, first paragraph. It's a biotech, biotech diagnostic company. Okay, right there, first sentence. I know what kind of company. It's not a software company. It's not a hardware company. It's a biotech diagnostics company whose novel tests are radically changing the way renal diseases, kidney diseases are diagnosed today. The test drastically improved the ability for clinicians to monitor the health of transplanted kidneys. Point they're making is in the unmet need, there are 85,000 patients waiting for a kidney transplant. They're saying half of these transplants, if they happen, are failures. Body rejects the kidney. What if you could run this test, which they they're came up with, it'll tell you will body accept this kidney or not. Then you do the kidney transplant. Make sense? No brainer, that's what it says. So then they describe their product. Oops. They describe the product, they say two products, PCR-based blood tests and, a, and tolerance test. And then they describe in some more details. Then some market uh, is the first kind of market. There are 290 transplant centers, 200 million with another 550 million internationally. And then second page, they talk about who the team is. You see teams that go into fair amount of detail. They talk about uh, founder and chair of organized scientific advisory board, Dr. Mimi Sarval. And she's famous, world-renowned in, in opinion leader in kidney transplant, Dr. Isha Abdullah. She was my friend. She's leading the operation, business development, marketing, blah, blah, blah. And CEO is Sally, Sally and Reese. And the, some of the milestones they have accomplished. Not complicated, whole business plan is described in one page. And this executive summary allowed them to raise $2 million. And they sold the company, I think two years, a year and a half later for $30 million. So this is a winning executive summary, simple, not complicated. This is another one, this is from my last company, Bitser Mobile. Again, not complicated, describes we are a technology leader in the enterprise mobility space, selected by Fortune 50 companies, blah, blah. Opportunity, which is the unmet need, who needs it, how big is the market? And then rest of the page is what is our solution, who's in the team? And this was it. And this company was acquired by Oracle. We did raise the money successfully. So point is, it's not complicated. There's several examples and I've given you two right there and I've given you links for more. So I'm going to now switch gear to a third topic, which is the pitch, because some of you wanted to hear that. So let me pause here for a few minutes to see anybody has any more questions I'm not addressing properly. Or you can just type that you're doing it properly, keep going. So then I know that you are with me. So give me some little feedback here before I continue to move forward. All right, so we got a one word of confidence, so we'll keep moving. The pitch, what the heck goes into a pitch? First of all, uh, in pitch, you you know what you're selling? A story. You're selling a story. If it ignites their imagination and they can get excited about it, they're buying the story. And story, like most Indian movie, is the same. Boy meets girl, girl doesn't like the boy too much, boy is persistent, after some events, finally she likes him, everybody's happy. It's always the same story. Same thing here. 
you saw a problem because of your unique background, you were able to see insight when other couldn't. You did market research to validate your thesis. Then you assembled the right team. You know exactly who the customers are. What is the problem? You know your competition. Now you need this many dollars to go from this stage to this stage and you know exactly how to do it. That's the story. It's always the same story. So you can communicate the story in a few slides, in one conversation, you are in the running. And then once you're you able to tell the story right, then you need to create this sense the train is leaving the station. If you don't jump on, we would have been gone. So you create this sense of scarcity when people are really trying to jump on the train, this is this is a compelling event. When other people are climbing the train, train is leaving. So, you, so okay, uh, Andreas, Andreas said, please put up the slide that preceded the example of executive summary. What is that slide? Before example, which slide is that? This one? I don't know, tell me more exactly what kind of slide are you looking for? So then I can put it up there. But I, I may even send you the slides so you know, you'll get them, so. And this uh, meeting is being recorded. So if anyone ever needs to go back and listen to the presentation, you can always do that as well. All right. Okay, so where are we? So common mistake. The most common mistake is over explaining the obvious. You don't need to spend seven minutes just telling me that cancer is a big problem and is a big market. Yeah, we know. Tell me what you're gonna do about it. So don't over explain the obvious, get to the needful. There's something I'll talk about slide zero, which is an important concept. I came up with it, so I'm trademarking this because slide zero is the very first slide in your deck, which has nothing on it to distract the audience. No pictures and no unnecessary words except the company name, your name, and a tagline. There are only two slides when you have that 100% of their attention. Slide zero and the slide which has financials on it. So you don't wanna rush through slide zero. This is when you open the right compartment of the brain when the words will go in. If you don't tell right up there, like we saw the organ eye, first line, we are a biotech diagnostics company. Okay, so now my open that compartment of my brain. So this is what you need to do here in slide zero. Then you need to have proper transitions. You need to have a team slide to what are the people, what are their roles so they understand and understand that. So how do you present efficiently and effectively? Let's get into this. So first of all, there's a TED talk. It's gotten a 1.3 million views, so it must be good. So I've given you the link, but if you can't remember the link, just type in how to pitch to VCs, David Rose. So it comes up. So it's a good one. I think no, most people, I don't agree with their, whatever they're saying, but this guy is pretty good. So David Rose, how to pitch to VCs. Because when you're going through all this rigmarole of unmet need and financial projection and team, VCs are only hearing three things. Is there money to be made here? Are, is this the people who can make me money? And how much money will I make? So everything which you say somehow needs to translate into those three things. So be aware of that and take advantage of that. So this is your slide zero. Doesn't have too many things to confuse them. It just forces them to listen to you see, okay, so you are a hardware and software company, okay. Oh, so you're a services company. You don't sell anything. Okay, got it. Now I'm ready to see what problem. So here you want to talk about what problem are you solving? Who has a problem? Why are you here? What problem are you solving? Who has this problem? Why are you here? So in my company, IntelliSense, I will say something like that. Grain, when you harvest it, like corn, soybean, wheat, never improves in quality. It goes downhill. What if using wireless sensors and artificial intelligence software, you can monitor and even predict the future quality of grain? Then you can make many decisions intelligently, when to sell, when to store, when to fumigate, when to handle. 
we are solving that problem. It's a huge worldwide problem. Some of you will say, wait a minute, you gave the whole story. Yeah. Well, am I at the birthday party? You'll be surprised at the end. No. Yes. I gave the whole story. If they're intrigued, they will listen. If they don't intrigue, maybe I'll cut it short and not waste their time and my time. So this is the point. Then uh, you will talk about the team, who you are, you know, who are the relevant people? Why should they take you seriously? So you, they know that you may not have all the right people in the team. So I, I'm an electrical engineer. So I know a lot about wireless technology and AI even. I don't know anything about agriculture. So what did I do? I, I put on my advisory board, the retired executive vice president of Safe Kelly Griffin. I put in uh, three professors from agricultural universities on my advisory board. So my team slide is me, my co-founder, and like three advisory board members who know a lot about agriculture. So look at this, eh, that, that looks like a reasonable team. So you want to plug the holes and show that you are a relevant team. Then you talk about your unmet need. What was the problem you saw? What pain are you alleviating? Give some use case example. So I, I in my grain example, I say, look, one of the interesting use cases transporting your grain in a barge on a river. Because when you harvest the grain, when you put it on the river in a barge, which is, has to be towed, the whole process down the Mississippi from Minnesota to New Orleans takes anywhere from two to six weeks. Sometimes it's standing over there before it could be unloaded. This is extremely dangerous for corn and any grain because there's a big discrepancy in moisture. Almost starts raining inside and mold happens and hot spot happens and smoldering happens and even barges catch fire. What if there was a way to monitor the temperature and humidity as the barge is traveling before the problem becomes a big problem? So this is unmet need. And I further mentioned that a company like ADM operates 23,000 barges up and down the Mississippi. No company solves this problem today. We are the first one. So this, you know, some, some way like defining the unmet need. Then I talk about who has this problem, who needs it more, and how big is that market segment? So suppose we were making a software which can uh, help improve your uh, SAT scores for math exams. So you can show them that different people, you know, this, this uh, could be high school seniors. This could be people who apply to college and wanna apply to a better college, or people who are coming from international students who wanna get into US college. Who needs this more? There's somebody who's more motivated, willing to pay you for this. And if you've done your market research, you'll be able to answer that question with some confidence. Do you wanna show that you've understood the market, studied the market dynamics, you know exactly who to go after and why? This is the slide to impress them with your market research, and then market sizing. Then you talk about your solution. So we haven't talked about solution, talk about market dynamics, market segment, unmet need. Now you talk about what, how you're going to solve it. This is where you can show a demo. You can show screenshots. You can show diagrams, whatever. Some way to convince them that you have a good solution which meets the problem you just identified. Then you talk about competition. What is the competition? Where are the weak spots? Don't say we don't have competition. Everybody has a competition because customers can do nothing. That's a competition. So then describe that you found the underbelly of the beast, something when the competition is weak at and you know exactly how to exploit it. This is what you wanna show that. Then you talk about your unfair advantage. Why now? Why us? That's a very important question. Why nobody has thought of it? Is it not legal, not technically possible? But if you can connect it with something because of the deregulation, now this is possible to do because of you know Obamacare or whatever. Something new happened or because of new technology like cloud technology or now we have mobile phones everywhere. So now this is possible. This is, you need to be able to answer that here. What special alliances relationship which will make this possible? Well, my co-founder got his PhD from UC Berkeley on this topic. Okay, that's your unfair advantage. 
My uncle works at Chevron and we have inside view the problems they're having today in the oil field. Okay, that's your unfair advantage. So then you wanna show positioning. How do you look different than other alternative customers have? Now, interesting part here is you get to pick the X axis and the Y axis. So whatever axis make you stand out, you get to pick. Are you the most integrated, the most expensive, the easiest to use, the most colorful? I don't know. So this is your chance to set the stage that we have talked to enough people, we understand if the product was like this and this, this will be most attractive for people. So then you wanna talk about your business model. How do you make money? What do you sell? See, every company has a business model. What is the business model of NBC? Well, they sell ads. You don't pay for NBC. What's the business model of Netflix? That's subscription. What's the Netflix, uh, the, what's the business model of Dropbox? Premium. What's the business model of uh, Intel? They sell devices. So every there's some business model. How do you make money? So showing some clarity that what a typical customer will pay us, what is our cost to making that product or servicing that customer? What's our customer acquisition cost? So you can show how much profit, gross profit will you make per customer, per unit. That shows clarity of mind, that you have thought through this thing. It's not complicated, but it'll take some clarity of mind to get to simplify this. Next thing, you number eight topic is go to market. Which segment, which sliver are you going after? How will you promote your product? Uh, what alliances or partnership do you need which will make your product be well known? How, how will you sell? Is it online? Is direct sales? Is indirect? Is through channel? All these things are need to be clear in your head, having done the market research, so you can clearly articulate them. When I told you when people fall short and don't have good answers, this one, number seven, business model, number eight, go to market. They usually fall, they wasted all their time in the first thing and they come here, they have no time left. So you really wanna be ready with those things. Then what progress have you made in the last six months? And what are some of the milestones coming up in the next 12 to 18 months? This shows that you have clarity of mind. How long the money will last? What will you do with it? When is your profit point? Do you have clarity on inflection point? You can put all this in a simple slide like that. So this one slide has all those answers. Like I'm raising half a million dollars now. In about nine months, we plan to come back and raise a $6 million Series A. And we would have, by that time, have 11 people in the company. We would have our first couple of betas installed. Then, you know, we launch the product a little bit later. Then we have third milestone. So this shows that you have thought through the business. You know what the milestones are next 18 months. How much money will you need? When will you need it? This makes you investor ready. And then you, based on that, you want to have your ask. How much are you raising? How long will it last? And what point of inflection it will take you? So here you want to show a spreadsheet. Don't show a picture, you know, graph that looks like this because every single startup company graphs looks like this. That doesn't provide any insights. You want to have a spreadsheet which shows more exactly what will be revenue, what will be your cost for the next five years. Which brings us to the fourth topic, a financial model because it's the financial model output, which you need to show them. So let me pause here, make sure I can address any question because this next topic is a heavy one. So if you were looking to get a drink, now is a good time to get the drink because for the next 10 to 12 minutes, it'll be a little heavy duty. And this is again, a good time to ask any clarifying question in chat or Q and A. So let's see. One question from Shyam is the two pager is still to get that initial meeting? Answer is yes, unless you can get it just from the email. But sometimes they wanna see a little bit more because a lot of people come and waste their time. So that one or two pager executive summary is that you have thought through the business enough that they yell, yeah, okay, let's meet. 
Okay, somebody, Shankar is asking, what is slide zero? Slide zero, I think I showed you an example. This is the first slide with nothing to distract the investors except your name, your company name, and a tagline. So for my company, I'll give you an example of my company, Telesense, that we are about grain never improves in quality. We are here to solve that problem of able to predict the quality so you can make smart decisions. So it's basically giving the whole pitch in, it's a, think of that as an elevator summary, elevator pitch given on slide zero. Because this is why they wanna stay in the meeting and pay attention to you. You wanna give them a reason to pay attention to you. Some of the questions about market research, I think I'll give some examples of that as well. How much time, money, and resources spend always a good dilemma? What do you mean? How much time, money, and resources spend on what? Why is that a dilemma? Don't know that one. Outsource market research or self-study. So under no condition, delegate the market research. Okay, market research is not a report somebody does. Let's talk about market research. Market research is the clarity between your two years in your head, which can only come if you have spent enough time talking to potential users, potential customer, potential partners, asking dozens of questions, not selling, not selling your idea. Do not ever bring up your product. You're trying to understand their mindset, their unmet need, so you can then go back and design the right solution. That's market research. So you have to do it. There's no shortcut. The three things in taglines, three things are company name, your name, and tagline of the company. Like, so in my case will be uh, company Telesense. My name is Naim Zafar, uh, founder CEO. Tagline is, we are maximizing the profits in grain supply chain using artificial intelligence and IoT. All right, financial model. Now this is gonna freak half of you out. Like, I don't know how to do financial modeling. Do I have to hire a CFO? Answer is absolutely not. It is, uh, so I mean, I was saying, is it okay to consume too much time? Well, that's what I'm saying. The market research to really understand the customer, their need, the unmet need, the competition, you don't do that over a weekend. It takes many, many weeks, anywhere one month to six months to really have that clarity in your head. Otherwise you're not investor ready. So, okay, financial model, what the hell is it? Financial model is the clarity on your business. It's, it's simply, it's an income statement, also known as PL, profit and loss statement, which every business needs to have. That shows you how much money do you need? How long would it last? How much uh, profit will you make? When will you make it? Many of you are thinking like, I have no freaking clue. How do I know how much money a sale will I have five years later? Aha, uh -huh. I'm gonna teach you some ninja tricks, so you can do that. So first of all, you need to list your assumptions. What assumption are you making about price, about cost? And you, from there, you can create a five-year P&L statement, especially for a B2B business, because first couple of years, you're gonna lose money. So then you wanna start making money to see how much money can you make. If you are a B2C business, then you know it's very hard to predict that long. You pretty much wanna come up with a three-year kind of a model and focus on metric, customer acquisition cost, churn. And if they can agree that, yeah, your numbers and computation is reasonable, then they know it could be a reasonably good business. So the basic structure of a PL statement is always the same. You list your sources of revenue, then you subtract your cost of goods sold from that, that gives you gross profit. Then you subtract your fixed expenses. Fixed expenses comes in three flavors, sales and marketing, research and development, and anything which is not making product or selling product in the third bucket called GNA, general and administrative. So every company from IBM to Cisco to your little startup has the same seven or eight rows in their income statement. And then you subtract your fixed expenses also known as OPEX, 
from your uh, gross profit, you get your net profit, also known as EBITDA, earnings before interest. So earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So what are these things? Don't need to know, and you don't care. Investors don't expect you to know. Only thing they care about is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Because that's not your department. You'll hire an accountant. He'll figure all that out. Just show me a bit up. So stop right here. Don't need to go any deeper than that. So let's look at some income statement from companies you may already know. Let's look at salesforce.com. What is their, this is from the internet. What does it look like? Well, it turns out it's exactly the same. They show revenue. They have two sources of revenue, subscriptions and services. They show them separately. Why do they show them separately? Because the cost of delivering that revenue, they actually lose money on services. Revenue is 50 million, they cost them 55 million. So they wanna separate the two so they can see investors, look at our product income, this is very profitable, 842 million, and the cost of delivering is this much. Now you say it's a pure software product. Some of you doing a software product. What is my cost of goods sold? Well, cost of goods sold is this. And this is cost of your production servers on Amazon Web Services, any hotline support customer service. So you'll find that even for pure software company, some number between 10% and about 24% of revenue could be the cost of all this cost of, this, this is your cost of revenue or cost of goods sold, it's called sometimes. So this is, you can assume some number between 10 and 24%, subtract that from revenue, and this is your gross profit. This is their gross profit. Because those servers cost money, bandwidth costs money, even some customer support costs money. So now, now you show your expenses, and this is salesforce.com is showing their expenses in three categories, R&D, which is 14% of revenue, sales and marketing, which sometimes is 53% of revenue, and so on and so forth. And then actually, this is the total fi fixed expenses. So when you subtract 728 from 683, they're actually losing $44 million. Below this thing is other things you don't care about. That's what accountants to figure out. You stop right here. That's your EBITDA, or also called operating income. Income from operations, operating income is negative here. So why I'm showing you this, because the anatomy of this thing is exactly the same, no matter which company you talk about. So let's look at open table, same kind of a thing. This is the revenue, their uh, operation and support, which is the cost of revenue is, is the 25%, $48 million. Then you have sales and marketing, 22%, R&D, 10%, GNA, 17%. So from income from operations, EBITDA is 24.4%. Below that, you don't care. Don't need to compute. My point is I'm giving you some example that every company looks the same when it comes to income statement. And you'll be using this knowledge to create your own financial model. So how do you start? It has two components. One is revenue, second is your expenses. So let's talk about revenue. Revenue, you start by how many doohickeys, units, whatever they are, subscription, hardware, can you sell in year one and two? Beyond that, you cannot see. And figure out what is the average selling price. So here's an example. This is for one of my companies. So you notice yellow, and my assumptions are in yellow up there. I'm assuming I can, this product has hardware and software both. And I'm assuming I can sell it for this amount, $3,500, and my cost is $1,400. Then I have a subscription, $250 a month, my cost is 50, this is per month. This is my assumption. Now based on what I think, it's gonna take me about eight, nine months to build the product. So after nine months, I'll sell only one. I'll get one customer. So one customer, they'll, my hardware sales is this much, my software sales, is 
times three, because they're three months and a quarter, is $750. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I'm assuming next quarter, I just get two more customers. So I have a total of three customers. So two more customers, each will pay $3,500, $7,000 in hardware sales. Now I have a total of three customers, three times 250 times three, 2250 is my software subscription revenue, and so on and so forth. I cannot see four or five years later. I should be able to see one or two years out. So that's all I did. Estimate how many new customers will I get? This gives me my hardware revenue. How many total customers will I have? This gives me my software revenue. And I've just, based on those simple assumptions, I can build my revenue model. My total revenue by adding those things up is right here. Now I look at my cost. So I have these assumptions right here on cost, hardware and software cost. I do the same thing. I have one customer uh, uh, right here, $1,400 is my cost coming right from here. My cost is $50 times three because three months and a quarter, that's my cost on the software. Then I just keep multiplying those numbers up here, just like I did for revenue. And this is my total cost. So just making some reasonable assumptions, I was able to estimate my approximate cost and revenue for the first couple of years. Are you with me so far? Now you may be wondering, okay, that's good. Let's work on my expenses. So I have a sum estimate for the year one and two revenue. I don't know about year five yet. Don't worry about it yet. What about expenses? Well, it turns out for most companies, initially, all your almost most of your expenses will be employees and contractors, people. Yeah, there may be some other employees, but that's bulk of it. So then you also wonder, like, okay, well, how do we figure this out? And what about all the other expenses, like travel, rent, medical insurance, taxes? I don't know those things. That's not my department. Don't worry. I'm going to show you a ninja trick number two which is going to help you there. And that is we're gonna add a overhead number anywhere from 20, I use 35% because give me a little cushion, it covers all those little things you have no time to compute. You add up the salary numbers, you multiply by 1.35, you get your burden cost, you're done. Now, if you're planning to file a lot of patents, you can add some extra money for legal, if you're planning to do a lot of marketing campaign, you can add some extra money for these expenses, but salaries will be bulk of your expenses. All right. Is it still with me here? Not losing people yet. I got lost a couple of people, but okay. Uh, I could do that. So, I just lost my window here. Okay, sorry about that. Let me get back my Q&A window. Where is my Q&A window? Here we go. Let's move this window here so we can look at it together. All right, right my Q&A window. Okay. So let's take a look what I was showing you. So this is how you start. You simply make a list, year one and two, when do you need to hire and who do you need to hire? So I figured out I need a CEO from day one, except I'm gonna only pay him as a half-time person for the first six months, then normal salary. I'm gonna need a, you know, VP of engineering from second month. I'm gonna need some software developers. If it's some part-time people or gonna pay them half-time salary, you can say 0.15 and some when you're full-time and when do you need them? So you simply, normally people can see how many people did it take to build a company. All the different titles you may need are listed here, they are which department they belong to. You look up what is a typical salary in your area and you figure out the monthly salary. That's the hardest job and this is not so hard then all you do is multiply this number with monthly salary and add them all up. So you have your monthly salary expense for each month. You simply multiplying these numbers with these numbers, adding them up. 
not complicated. So you add them all up and suddenly you have, uh, you have your total monthly expense. You can add them up for the whole year. Then since you wanna understand how much would it cost with all the miscellaneous expenses, you simply take these numbers and you multiply them with 35%. So basically you multiply all these numbers with 1.35 and that gives you your burden cost per month. So you do that all numbers and you add them all up. So you have year one expenses and similarly do for year one and two. You cannot see beyond second year, but year one and two, you should be able to see who do you need to hire, how many people you need. Guess what? At this point, you're about 70% done with your financial model. It was not that complicated. Now we know what is the shape of the curve for every startup company. You know the revenue sort of rises with zero and goes exponentially high. Expenses start high and then taper off. And at some point that gives you the profit point. This is the shape of every company. So we know the shape. We're gonna take advantage of that to predict what we need to be down the road. And this is where your ninja trick number one is going to come up. Remember, we looked at salesforce.com. I was telling you what percent of the revenue they spend on these categories. I wrote them down. We're going to use that secret technique because in every industry, company one is stable. By the time year five comes, they'll have their expenses on the category in a narrow range. So if you pick for year five, a number in the in the that reasonable range, nobody will be surprised. So what you do, you study that. You looked. I looked at LinkedIn.com. What percent of the revenue do they spend on those categories? You notice here, sales and marketing, thirty-five percent. Product development, R&D, twenty-five percent. GNA, sixteen percent. You looked at Salesforce numbers here. Similar, R&D, fourteen percent. Sales and marketing, fifty-three percent. GNA, fifteen percent. I mean, all the numbers right here of the red. You see these numbers? So they're all in narrow range. So what is the range? Let's talk about two things which I want you to uh, appreciate. So three ninja tricks I'm teaching you how to come up with this thing quick, quickly. First ninja trick was use the 35% overhead numbers on, on salary so that you don't have to worry about all the little expenses which you don't know how to compute. Second ninja trick is any company which is attracted to VC, by the time fifth year comes, somewhere year five, needs to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a invisible magic box. I call it the strike zone. It's like an invisible strike zone in baseball, which is between 50 million and 150 million, oh, sorry, 100 million. If your year five revenue falls somewhere in that strike zone between 50 to 100, it will look normal and attractive to a VC. So ninja trick number two is you're gonna pick a number in the strike zone for your year five revenue. And you're gonna pick it in the strike zone. Now this is look maybe some suspicious and almost illegal to some of you. It's not. There's no VC will be interested in a company from you after five years of hard work, your revenue is gonna be $11 million because you're probably too optimistic anyways. You probably hit half the numbers. It's an exciting company. Nobody would want to buy that company. If you are more than 100 million, that's like requires an explanation. But if you're in that range of 50 to 100 million, that will be what will be already be looking for and will look normal to you. Requires no explanation. But you'll, you'll have an explanation which you'll offer it. So don't feel bad about it because this is, you know, you do that in your life all the time. You put a stake in the ground and then you make it come true. For example, you say we're going to vacation in Australia this Christmas. You don't know where to go, you know, which airline will you take? You do, but you declare it and then you backward figure it out where to go, what to do, how much would it cost? Same thing here. 
You put a number there, then you figure out how many people you need to hire to hit that number. What products do you need to hit that number? What geographies you need to be operating to hit that number? So you make it come true. You come up with a story which makes sense. So ninja trick number three deals with how to use that data to predict how much expenses will you have in year three? I call that zone of reason. In every industry, expenses fall in a typical bucket. In high-tech companies, in R&D, if you study like 100 companies, you'll find they spend anywhere between approximately 12% to 20% of their revenue in R&D. You'll find for sales and marketing, these companies spend anywhere between 35 to about 55% in sales and marketing. In GNA, the number will be typically between eight to 16%. So ninja trick number three is, if you pick a number in, in that range for your year five revenue, sorry, for your year five expenses, you can compute your year five expenses. So I'm gonna use some numbers from in this range, multiply by the number I picked here, that will give you my expenses for this year. Let me show you how this works. By the way, you notice they're all in that range I talked about? 35, 25, 16%. So this is what happens. You compute bottom up. This is what an income statement looks like. It has some assumptions about revenue, gross profit, expenses. You compute how many people will you hire and you compute it numbers here for year one and two expenses. Then you look how many widgets can you sell year one and two, you, you estimated some revenue number for year one and two. Third thing you did was you study your industry and you picked some number in the zone of reason. And number four thing you did was you picked a number from the strike zone for year five revenue. You multiplied number three with number four and you computed year five expenses. Now, since we know the shape of the curve is like this, if you have this number and you have this number and you have computed this number and this number, year, year, year one, year two, and year five, you know the shape of the curve. So for year three and four, you can extrapolate. Because as long as the shape of the curve looks like this, nobody will blame you. That's your ninja trick number three. So with these using these three tricks, you can quickly create in one afternoon a reasonable looking model, which you can then defend yourself in front of the investors. So, so you, then when you figure out this five number, then you extrapolate number which support that. So if you look here, this, what I just did looks like that. I had my assumptions on cost and price. I figured how many units can I sell in each year? Remember I did quarterly, now I'm summarizing yearly. Then my revenue, my expenses in three buckets, and when I add them all up, I can see that I'm gonna be needing to raise a total of probably four to $5 million because I'm negative the first two years. So this tells me that I may wanna raise maybe, I don't know, a million dollars or $1.5 million. And then I'll come back and raise another $5 million later. So this is how you build a financial model. And we can do a longer conversation, a special workshop just on this, but I'm giving you a high speed version given the time constraints we have. So once you've built that, we're coming to the end of the presentation here. So we have done the executive summary, we did the pitch, we did the financial model. Now you a little bit talk about the key performance indicators. Should I wait? Should I answer any questions you have? We only have a few slides left. We can finish it and then talk about it because we only have a couple of slides. There's one question related to financial model. Uh, is it advisable to show financial models that have two or three projections? meanings with best case, worst case, and highly likely cases, which may give the investor an idea of range of outcomes? Short answer is no. Pick one and stick with it. 
because if you're showing three models, that's this, that, it's too confusing. They don't, they figure out, they don't know which, which way to go. Make some assumption and show the model, a model, one model. Remember, this one model is never constant. As you learn more, every year I update my model. It kind of pushes everything out a little bit. But every year you, you know more, you'll more about, you learn more about your market, you'll more learn about your constraints and you can change the numbers. They don't blame you for updating it if they can, you can explain it, but don't go with three models. Go with one model. Again, you could be conservative and should be conservative in your year one and two, but year four and five, you could be more aggressive. Why? Because A, it's so far away, many things will change. Nobody's gonna hold you to that. They wanna see that you know, see, they know that you don't know what your sales will be five years out. They know that. But the fact you have a cogent way of thinking about it and you're in the zone of reason, this shows that you're financially smart enough to take my check and do something useful with it. So this is the whole point. So you can say year one and two, we are very focused on California. We wanna prove the model here. Then year three and four, we start selling nationwide. Year five, why did you jump so much? Oh, because we're entering the European market. So you can come up with some explanation and justification why it will be rosy down the road. So unit economics, depending on business you are in, every business has a unit. For hospital, it's the bed. For coffee shop, it could be what profit and gross profit per cup of coffee we make per store. So you need to have thought through this thing. If your restaurant could be per table, what, what is the revenue? What is the cost? What's the profit per unit? Because if the unit is profitable, then we have millions of units, your profits will multiply. But if you're losing money on every unit, then why should we expand this thing? So this is your way to explaining that you understand the unit economics. Then you also want to be aware about customer acquisition costs, churn rate, if you go show off with the product, churn means every year, some percent of customers will leave you for whatever reason. So you have to factor that in. If his churn is zero, means your model probably is flawed because every industry, every customer, and is it 5% a year? Is it 5% a month? It will dictate how many customers you can get and what's your customer acquisition cost is. So you can market research, you can go to Quora and Google or Google or ask in Quora, what is a typical churn rate in your industry and people will have answers and it's published. It's not hard to find. What are the milestones you're, you are trying to achieve in the next 18 months? What's on your dashboard? What are we be monitoring? Well, we'll be monitoring daily customer visits. How many minutes they spend on our app and how many times they share whatever we make. That could be your three things you're watching. They wanna know that you understand your business, is virality, is uh, dynamics. What will you be watching? So you wanna have those answers ready. So I'm gonna stop here because we're at, uh, you know, we have only six minutes left for our Q and A. So point is, the whole point of being investor ready is to have enough material having done the market research. So you're not just BSing them, but you have unique insights which you can demonstrate your command of the market and your understanding of the customer dynamics. This is where the imagination come alive. So you can demonstrate the deep insight about market and your customers, you know exactly what the next few steps you need to take. Then chances are they'll get excited because they're looking for those entrepreneurs with new ideas who have done their homework and you will be very fundable. So somebody wanted to go to previous slide. I'm here. Is there any ratio of customer acquisition cost to customer lifetime value? Well, every industry, it changes, but it's not the ratio which is important, but point is that does, if you're selling something for $10 and your cost is $3, but if your customer acquisition cost is $10, well, you're gonna lose money on every, every transaction because you only have $7 of gross profit. $10 is the, so, you know, just to write that down here. Uh, so customer pays you, let's say, 
seven dollars. Your cost of making the product is three dollars. Well, what's your customer acquisition cost? Well, you only have in this transaction seven minus three. You have four dollars of gross profit to make. If customer acquisition cost is four dollars, then you're making zero net. So you want to make sure your customer acquisition cost is reasonable, and you can still make a profit after paying this thing and paying this thing. So this is the kind of clarity you want to arrive at and have numbers to substantiate it. So, so somebody asked a question, uh, what about if I'm building hardware product and using SaaS model, essentially leasing out some maintenance expenses, how to estimate those expenses? Well, what do you mean how to you estimate your expenses? Like try to talk to, suppose I'm making something which costs $100 and customers are gonna lease it out to customer for $10 a month. So I know it'll take me 10 months to recover the cost. So I better be signing the customer up for a 12 to 18 months contract because first 10 months will be just recovering my cost and then I'll start making some profit. So this is how you do it. But all these things you need to be able to able to compute. So this is what I mean by being customer ready. Being customer ready means you have thought through these things. You're ready to answer those questions. You don't want to approach the customers, uh, investors, before you have done this thinking and some calculation. Otherwise, they'll, you know, it's a supply and demand issue. They have 100 people who approach them every week. Which two or three or four people they're going to take some interest and listen to, the one which has done some thinking, are able to answer the questions like this when they come up and not bewildered when they hear the word customer acquisition cost or churn. Somebody wants to see the previous slide from here. This one. So what else? So, you know, if you guys can also leave some comments, is, is, is this useful? Should we do more topics? What topics will be interesting to you if we do future webinars? This is your time to give us some feedback. Uh, you can put them in chat box also. So then Nihar can copy them, but you know, you know, we, we can, for example, somebody says we can do a whole hour and a half on financial modeling because I, I did it very fast. I can do it slowly, give you more examples. So we can do a full workshop on how to do financial modeling, of course. That's a possibility. Uh, so, you know, happy to do more webinars. This is what we do at Thai and it's all free. Check this out. So appreciate your comments and uh, Nihar, if you can take notes of other comments and things we should be doing in the future, we'd love to come back and help you guys in more ways. Yes, I'll take note of all of the recommendations that people have in the chat. Yeah, so you you know, we went through a lot of stuff in a short period of time. So there's a so hopefully you walked away with clarity. The five things. What are the five things? You have the introduction, the icebreaker, how do you approach them? With what email? Then you have your executive summary, then you have your pitch, then you have your financial model, then you have your KPIs. You put them all together and you become very much fundable. It's not going to be quick. It's going to take you a few months to pull it all together. It's going to require some customer conversations, but you can get there because thousands of companies get started in Silicon Valley and get funded. So you're at the right place at the right time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shane, for your time. I'll go ahead and uh, take note. So um, if you guys have, just keep adding the recommendations in the chat there as well. Um, if you haven't already, or if you not, are not already, make sure to become a Thai member as well. You guys can check that out at sv.thai.org. Excellent. We'll look forward to seeing you and Nihar will send you some of the slides. So, you know, feel free to come back anytime. All right. Yes. And I'll also be posting the YouTube recording as well in the next day or two. Yeah. And yes, COVID reality is uh, changes things, but it's an opportunity. See, for an entrepreneur, no crisis should be wasted. So while many people will suffer because of Corona, but many new things are starting. How to deliver online education more effectively? Big topic. How to do collaborate among teams from when you're not able to go to work. There'll be a lot of startups doing that. 
quick testing. And so there'll be, so there's opportunity in every crisis. So th this is a good time for you to be an entrepreneur and be thinking about how to solve the problem which has faced the society. All right, I won't take many time, it's 7.30, good night, see you soon. Thank you everyone, have a good rest of the night.